Engineering involves the design of an artificial system, quite distinct from a natural system, to perform a function, task, or service to satisfy a perceived societal need. Engineering uses physical, chemical, and biological principles to design a certain system with the focus on performance. The design life is the expected time counted from system inception and typically measured in years that would have to pass before the system loses its intended function, at which time it is either repaired, replaced, or retired. Time engineering is defined here as the engineering which has the specific purpose of buying time from nature. Geologic time is nature's clock. Human time is but a small fraction of it. The Earth was formed about 4.6 billion years ago, yet the entire time span of human civilization is estimated at about 10,000 years, amounting to barely 0.0002% of geologic time. The time frame of human existence, where a generation typically spans 25 years and a human life may last an average of three generations, is also small compared to the time span of human civilization. The number of human generations in the recognized time span of civilization is about 400. The ratio of time span of civilization to time span of an individual's life may be around half this amount, that is, 200. Thus, the time of humans is relatively small compared to the time of history. In turn, the latter is small compared to all time. This discussion of time and engineering is relevant because it is closely linked to the issue of sustainability. What should be the time frame of sustainable engineering design? Four generations? Forty generations? Four hundred generations? Or, ideally, the maximum possible? That is, forever. These issues are addressed here with reference to the case of the Salton Basin in California. The concept of frequency-based design is well established. Projects are designed to perform their intended function for a certain number of years, after which some type of failure is to be expected. For instance, in hydraulic engineering, the return period of 100 years is normally regarded as a standard return period for average-sized regional projects. Lower return periods from 10 to 25 years are usually considered for smaller projects, such as culverts, while higher return periods, 500 years, are applicable to larger projects, such as bridges. In the case of dams, where failure may lead to loss of life, return periods up to 10,000 years, and sometimes even larger, have been considered. Uncertainties in the statistical analysis have led to the use of a deterministic estimate referred to as the probable maximum precipitation, or PMP. Frequency-based design differs from time engineering in one important respect. Frequency-based design sets an arbitrary limit after which failure is to be expected on the basis of a statistical probabilistic analysis. On the other hand, time engineering ostensibly does not define the time to failure. Instead, it borrows from geologic time an undefined, relatively small amount of time in order to provide an economic value to society. In hydraulic engineering, time engineering has a distinct geomorphological flavor. While the time span of geomorphological processes is measured in millions of years, that of the human experience may be at most several thousand years. This time scale difference places at odds natural laws with the realities of the socioeconomic world. Natural processes will still take place in due time, but it may take too long, long enough to be of little consequence to human society. Thus, a conscious decision is made to sidestep the laws of nature and forego its long-term consequences.
A significant case study of time engineering is that of the Salton Basin, a geologic depression between two parallel faults located in southeastern California and lying partly below sea level. From a geomorphological perspective, the region is in the rake with no outlet to the sea. Millions of years ago, the entire Salton Basin used to be part of the Gulf of California, which reached northward a distance of about 250 kilometers, ending in the proximity of what is now the city of Indio in Riverside County. Given the location of the basin's southernmost extremity, in Baja California, Mexico, immediately west of the mouth of the mighty Colorado River, a different destiny was surely in store for the region. In geologic time, the Colorado River deposited enough sediments near its mouth to create a natural barrier, effectively cutting off the Salton Basin from the Gulf of California. Judging from satellite imagery, the minimum elevation of the mound between Mexicali, Mexico, and the Gulf of California is about 13 meters. In contrast, the elevation of the bottom of the Salton Depression to the north is minus 87 meters, while that of the Gulf of California to the south is zero meters. The prevailing hydraulic gradients dictate that the Colorado River could flow either north toward the Salton Basin or south toward the Gulf of California, depending on the vagaries of the flow of water and sediments and the consequent shape of the mound, which tends to vary in geologic time. Prior to contemporary settlement, the Salton Basin was known to contain Lake Cahuilla, implying that the Colorado did flow north periodically, with the period to be measured in centuries. Towards the end of the 19th century, the portion of the Salton Basin north of the U.S.-Mexico border was known as the Colorado Desert. At about the year 1900, its name was changed to Imperial Valley, setting the stage for the intense agricultural development that ensued. However, due to the enormous quantities of sediment being transported by the Colorado River, management of the river for irrigation development proved to be a challenge. History shows that in 1905, the Colorado River tried once again to reclaim Lake Cahuilla. A fight ensued in a concerted effort led by E. H. Harriman of the Southern Pacific Railroad Company resulted in the triumph of the will of man, with the Colorado being routed south against its own design. The success in harnessing the Colorado River contributed to the development of the Imperial and Mexicali Valleys on each side of the U.S.-Mexico border, with the attendant economic benefits to society. With a secure source of water from the Colorado assured, the desert proved to be very productive, due in part to its mild climate, but also to its plentiful store of fresh nutrients. The downside, however, is that in arid lands, increased agricultural productivity generally results in increased salt waste. Thus, for the past nearly 100 years, the salt wastes of the Imperial Valley and Coachella Valley to the north have accumulated in the Salton Depression to form the Salton Sea, a large saline water body. Indeed, the Salton Sea constitutes an artificial monument to the intense agricultural activity in the region. Will the Colorado River again attempt to flood the Salton Basin in the future? The answer to this question is probably. Much less certain is the time frame of the probable occurrence. In typical geomorphological character, the associated return period would be anybody's guess. In the meantime, life, in most of its manifestations, continues to thrive in the Salton Basin. A related question is the following. In view of the inherent hydrological risk, should the Salton Basin have been developed at all? The answer has socioeconomic and political implications. Yes, as long as the risks are recognized and noted for the future. In practice, the chances are slim that we may ever get to experience the event. Thus, in the realm of time engineering, human-driven economic interests are poised to rule 
over nature's geomorphological truisms.